Morning Fellowship Bible Church. This has been such a great time of worship today, and I'm excited that I get to continue our worship through uh, getting into God's Word and digging into it together. Uh, I'm Adam McMahon. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the executive pastor. Uh, Our lead pastor is in the Philippines right now on a mission trip, so be sure to be in prayer for him. Uh, We're real excited that he's getting to be able to uh, go on there. It sounds like it's been a great trip so far. Uh, and they should be getting back this coming week. So be in prayer for that entire team and uh, for our lead pastor as well. Uh, I also want to be sure to welcome back our youth. I'm so glad y'all made it back. You've had a couple people come up here and speak from the youth, uh, and they both sounded like they might be a little sick, and I I think that they are. Uh, (laughs) Apparently, as great as the youth trip was and, and reach camp is, apparently you also get sick sometimes. So I don't know, lack of sleep... Everyone's sleeping near each other. You get sick. It happens. Uh, So be sure to be praying for their recovery from camp, which is kind of funny to think about. I'm also glad to be able to be up here because I get to see a lot of friends, old friends. We have uh, the Vances are back. We're really excited. They're back from uh, Brazil. And I think I saw the McGlots up here. And uh, they're back in in town for just a little bit. Uh, Really good friends of ours that have been overseas for a long time. So I'm very excited to get to be up here. I also want to mention that prayer lunch again. Jordan mentioned it at the beginning of the service, but please come to that. Uh, We want to be praying together as a community of faith for our church, for the direction of the church. And um, the way you can sign up for that, that's a link that's in your bulletin, and you just type that into your browser at home on your computer or in your smartphone and fill out the form. Uh, it is case sensitive. If you get the wrong, you know, the wrong order, apparently it'll pull up ESPN somehow. I'm not really sure how that worked, but it will. So be sure to get the right case. But we really encourage you. Please come. Uh, we'd love for you to come. Our deacons are preparing a phenomenal meal for all of us of spaghetti, and uh, they're paying for all that. So please uh, come out, be in prayer with us, and we would love for you to connect with us. All right. Now I. I'm very excited, as he is as well, and we're both, because uh, I'd I say I'm excited about opening God's Word because this is a great, and also it's kind of a confusing passage, right? I mean, Gary did an excellent job reading it, but it's kind of still confusing, and a little bit of insider baseball on this. I didn't get to choose which passage. You don't always get to. Todd chose this one for me, so I worked really hard on it. Uh, hopefully, uh, as we dig into it together, uh, we'll be able to understand it better. But I am excited about this passage, even if I didn't get to choose it. Now, this is the fourth week in our summer series. Uh, We're calling the series, well, we're calling it DTR. That stands for Define the Relationship. Because despite how so many of us hate to have that conversation, and it's okay to admit that, most of us do, to have the DTR, it's really an essential part of any relationship is to know what the relationship actually is between one another. And that's no less true for us as a church. We need to know what our relationship is to each other and to God as well. Now, I'll be at risk of stating the obvious, but but this is important. And kids, this is important for you to hear as well. Uh, You did not get up to go to church today. Okay. You didn't get up to go to church. I know that sounds confusing. You're actually, you're not in a church. Now, let me explain. A church is not defined by a building. But you did get up today. Hey, thank you, by the way. It's difficult to get up after the 4th of July. It's been a long weekend, especially for parents. Uh, But you didn't get up to go to church. You got up to go to the gathering of Fellowship Bible Church as we worship together corporately, as we are in worship together. Now, that might sound like splitting hairs just a little bit, but it's a big difference because it changes how you see yourself, how you see each other, and how you read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible in light of we be, us being the church, those sorts of passages make a lot more sense. Because you are the church. We are the church corporately together. The church isn't something that exists outside of you as some organization or some institution. It's you. You are Fellowship Bible Church all week. When you work, when you're watching TV at your small group, when you're playing with your kids, when you're on vacation, when you're on a mission trip, when you're working out, you are the church. You see, you never cease to be FBC once you're apart. We're like Hotel California. 
you can be, anyway, yeah, so. listen to the song. Okay. And so uh, we've been looking at who we are first, you know, the, in the series, who we are, our identity as the church, as, as FBC. You see, we, we looked at that we are, we are believers united by Jesus. That is, Toby said, we are a family and that we are the body of Christ. And this is important because what you do must always flow from who you are. It's always that way. You see, you are not what you do. What you do shows who you really are. Your identity always comes first. Well, okay, that's the short introduction to the series. So we got a lot to go through today. So I have to start by asking this question. I want a show of hands. So get ready. Who here has ever been worshipped? Any, I know everyone's like a little scared of answering that. If you've been, you ever been worshipped that you know of? Maybe you didn't know. Okay, I'll venture to guess that most of us have been worshipped at some point or another. I played high school football in Texas, so you know I've been worshipped. I mean, that's just a fact about Texas. I mean, the SEC, they might have worship pegged on college football teams, but in Texas, all we really care about is high school football. Anyone from Texas can give me an amen, say thank you. I need the interaction. Uh, I mean, Texas takes high school football to another level. And just look at this stadium. This is a stadium for a high school football team. That is crazy. I mean, even as, but it, I'll tell you, even as incredible as that high school stadium is, that's Allen, that's a, in the Metroplex area, by the way, and wow. I've been to a few of those stadiums like that, and they're all just amazing. Uh, but even as they are, as incredible, as extravagant as they are, none of that compares to what happens on a Friday night in the fall at a small town. And if you've ever experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. It's a cultural experience. It's a worship experience. I've been to a few of these small town games. You see, everything closes down in the entire town. Everyone is in that stadium cheering on a few kids playing a game like it was life or death. It's amazing. And so, yeah, I've been one of those kids. I played football in high school, and I should say that I was on the football team. I didn't actually get to play a whole lot. Uh, I was what you call a special teams specialist. <laughs> I got to play a little bit, not a lot, but I was on the team and I will claim it. And uh, it was in my hometown of Wichita Falls and, and we were number one in the state for the majority of our senior season, right? So, so we had the number one, we actually had this huge number one on our high school, like all the way up all four floors, and it was, got ridiculous. But it felt like this entire town, it was over 100,000 people, they worshiped us. Now, let me give you a bit of history here so you really understand the context. You see, my high school, they were this old powerhouse in football. You see, they hadn't won much of anything since my parents were in high school, but they were this old powerhouse. And so there's even this book written about the history of the football team. So if you want more of the history, you can read the book. This is it. Hail to our colors. Yeah, we have a book. And uh, it's it called Hail to our colors, a complete history of coyote football. Now, the coyote was our mascot. And it's not coyote. That's everywhere else. But in Wichita Falls, that animal, it's the coyote. I don't understand it, but it's okay. Actually, I never heard of it called anything else until I moved. Uh, and yes, those trophies, that's six state championship trophies that they had won like forever ago. And we got to look at every time we went to practice, we'd walk by the trophy, all those trophies, and we would get to see them. So you get the picture, right? To this town, we were the return of the dominance that these old men, they've been dreaming and praying for, for like 30 years. And finally, we're reaching the top again. And they're so excited. And so we played at the college football stadium. And we would fill that whole stadium out every Friday night. We'd pack it out. In the playoffs, we'd go to other teams' home fields. And we'd have more, more people in our stands than they would in the home side. It was crazy. I would go to the grocery store. And I would get recognized by adults, people I'd never met before, and I didn't even play that much, by full-grown adults who would stop me and they would talk to me about high school football as though they knew exactly who I was. It was wild. And we had two other high schools that were about the same size as ours, 
But for the whole town in the fall of 2000, they were all coyotes. We were all rooting for that one team. And I really felt like it got out of hand. But we all want to identify with someone, with something, with a team. We all want to be a part of something. We all want to worship something. And so that's what that town was doing. And I think that's no less true for us. And I don't even need to point out the state champion Longview Lobos. Go Lobos. That's right. Got it from a couple. Okay. To make that case, I appreciate you proving my point uh, for too long. (laughs) You see, we want to identify with a group, right? We want to be a part of a group. So say you're a Dallas Cowboy. And so we, eh, well, or whatever football team you want to say, we won on Sunday, right? But you didn't play? How did you win? You weren't even there. But it's we, right? Or you're an Aggie or a Longhorn, a Texan, some other football, or some other state, I don't know what the other states are, a Republican, (laughs) a Democrat, uh, a Libertarian, or maybe you're an American. Uh, And I gotta say, (laughs) and, and there's nothing wrong with being a part of most of those things. You can still be a Cowboys fan. I'm not gonna shame you. I don't know about everybody else, but I won't shame you about that. Now, if you're naggy, we can talk about this, you know, after the service about the sin in your life. We can talk about that. Now, I'm kidding. I love my Aggie friends. I have a lot of them. Okay, maybe a little bit less now, but I had a lot of them. Uh, But the question is, do those things determine who you are? Do those things determine who you are? What is it that determines who you are, what your identity is? And for the church... For us to answer that question, it's different than the rest of the world. We're a different group. We're, we're unique in that way. So what determines who you are, who, who we are as a corporate body? Is it what God says about you? Is it what others say about you or what you decided to be a part of? So in 2 Corinthians 6, 15 through 7, 1, we'll see the answer to that question. We'll see who we are. And as a result of who we are, how to live. Now, let me tell you a bit about 2 Corinthians real quick. uh, As you guys turn there or open your app or whatever, however you want to get to it, it's also going to be on the screen. So if you happen to not have any of those things. First, it's a letter that Paul wrote. He wrote this letter to a particular church in a particular town, the town of Corinth. You see, Paul, he he started that church and he made at least a few uh, trips back to visit so he goes back and he visits Corinth, and then this interaction that he has with them, they, he writes letters back and forth between them, and we have a couple of them. And so in between the first the visits, he wrote, writes the first letter. That's 1 Corinthians. And then he visits again, and we get 2 Corinthians. And you can tell from the letter that he cares for these people. He cares deeply for them in that they have a lot of issues. They just are issue full. They're a local church. We all have these kind of issues. And so we get to see both of those in this section where we see who they are, how they should live, and why. And by the way, by extension, we as another local church, we get to see who we are, how we should live, and why. First, who are we? Who, we, who are we? The answer is we are God's temple. In verse 16, we see this. We are God's temple. Look at verse 16. We'll see one of the most amazing, one of the most profound truths about who you are in all of scripture in verse 16. And it reads this, for we are the temple of the living God. Now, let me repeat that. For we are the temple of the living God. Now, that's not a lot of words. But it doesn't take much to be incredibly profound, especially when it's in the Bible. So why do I say that's so profound? Hey, I'm glad you asked. Okay, I'm glad I asked. Uh, First off, check this out. You see the the word that Paul uses here uh, in Greek, it's naus. It's for the whole, it's not for the whole temple complex. It's not for all the buildings and the court and all of that stuff. That's a completely different word. I think I have a picture of it. There it is. That's the whole temple complex. That's not what he's talking about. What he is talking about in the Old Testament here, this word is is just for the holy of holies, the naus. I think I have a picture of that too. There it is. Uh, The most holy place 
where God's presence dwelled. See, this is what it would have looked like. The Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, the Shekinah of God, his majestic and his radiant glory, it rested there. The Holy of Holies was where the perfection of his holiness dwelled. The temple was where God met his people. He would meet his people through the high priest who would enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. So it's in that view that the Gospel of John, it opens up in John 1.14 with these words. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, that word dwelt, it literally means to live in a tabernacle, to live in a temple. You see, John, he's pointing back to show that Jesus, as God, he's not merely dwelling in a temple where only one priest could ever interact with him. Now Jesus, he has come as the word made flesh. He is the Shekinah glory of God. That glory that was once seen in the tabernacle is now embodied in Jesus. The Old Testament temple where it was the place of relationship with God, where he met and he spoke with his people. But now we see God and we meet God in Jesus. The temple was the place of sacrifice where people came from their, for their sins to be forgiven. But now we have Jesus, whose death on the cross for our sins was all the sacrifice that was ever needed for all the sins of the world. Now, instead of coming to a temple, we come to Jesus. But get this, that's not all. It gets even better. Because we, the church, are the body of Christ. And so we are that temple. We are the temple that God is pleased to dwell. God's Shekinah glory and holiness now abides in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That same glory that was in the pillar of fire that the Israelites followed in the desert during the Exodus, the same glory that God told Moses he couldn't look on his face and live, that same glory is now in us. We are the temple of the living God. I mean, how exciting, how incredible is that? So this week, I, I stumbled across these YouTube videos. Uh, I should say my kids stumbled across them. And it's this game that just has some electronic dance music and some animations. I, I know there's some point to this game, but I'm not really sure what it is. But my kids love it. My youngest, Cohen, he especially does. He gets this incredible excitement. And, and this is what it looks like. Sh check out this short video I shot. <laughs> I mean, he's just excited. He's just jumping everywhere. He can't contain himself. I think that's it. There might be a few more. Ah, well, that's good enough. We got enough of it. Now, he's just beside himself with this energy and this excitement. Okay, so why do I show this to you? You see the energy, the excitement that he has there? Uh, it, it's, that's the, he, he expressed that. It's excitement that we have. Now, ours is expressed differently, as you can clearly tell, because none of y'all got up and started dancing around when you heard about us being a temple. And that's great, because it might be a little bit more subdued, because we're adults, and we're going to chill. But that's the excitement that we ought to have when we find out that we are the temple of the living God. God, in all his glory, all his holiness, and his splendor literally dwells in us. I mean, it's an amazing miracle. And if that doesn't excite us and motivate us, then I honestly, I don't know what will. But what does it God, being God's temple motivate us to? How should we then live? How do we live? Is the computer has broken, and that's okay. We're going to keep moving. It's going to get fixed. Uh, how do we live? Well, first, don't identify with unbelievers. Uh, if you're filling in the blanks, I, the blank is identify. Don't identify with unbelievers. And here's what I mean when I say identify. You see, as the church, we don't get our identity from unbelievers. We don't get our identity from our connection with unbelievers, from our connection to a team, from any connection outside of God. So Paul, he tells the Corinthian church to do three things, right, in this passage. The first command is in verse 14. And he tells them, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
So what does that mean? And I'll be honest, I had to look it up because I am not a farmer about what a yoke looks like. But what I understand is that farmers, they would use them, they'd use this yoke and they'd tie it to, you know, to two ox or two donkeys or two mules or whatever, and they'd pull what they needed to pull with that. Well, if you had an ox on one side and like a donkey on the other, it kind of gets everything all messed up and it doesn't, the, the rows don't go straight, you can't pull straight, it gets all kinds of confused. So you'd do better if you yoke two donkeys together or two ox, but if you got them mixed, then they get unequally yoked and it ends up terrible. So the metaphor here that Paul's making is that's just how messed up it would be. That's how much it would be just totally terrible if that happened. If you had two, a believer being connected to an unbeliever. So the question, of course, is now what kind of connection is he talking about? What is he writing about here? The next order, I think, makes it a little bit more clear. And to that, you've got to look down to verse 17. It's in the middle of this, I call it an Old Testament quote mashup, because what Paul did here is he kind of took... He, he normally, you see these quotes, and it's like very obvious. It's a reference to a particular part of the Old Testament. Well, sometimes, this happens to be one of the times when you're looking at this quote, it's actually kind of this like conglomeration of a bunch of Old Testament uh, quotes. And so they're kind of, they get kind of mixed up. But, you know, us being able to look back at the Old Testament, we can see what he's referring to. And so in the middle of this Old Testament quote mashup, we see in verse 17. Uh, and in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians, you see him say, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and do and touch no unclean thing. Okay, so that sounds pretty harsh, right? I mean, he says to, to go out from their midst. It sounds contrary to things like, I don't know, the Great Commission it says, go therefore and make disciples, or Paul's life where he's traveling all over, uh, you know, East Asia, trying to you know, reach people all over the Rome, er, Roman area or much of Paul's other letters or even this letter. So should we only ever interact with other Christians for everything? Should we only ever interact with Christians? Is, that's what, is that what he's saying? Some kind of isolated, walled off community where we have no interaction with anyone outside of each other? Okay, I don't think so. I think that would be the wrong way of reading this. Okay, so here, here's the context of the quote. He's taking it from Isaiah. And Isaiah is telling the Israelites to get out of Babylon. He's telling them to come back to Israel, to come back to Jerusalem, to get away from these pagan practices, these idols, these false gods that are all over Babylon as they're trying to connect them into and make uh, the Israelite people Babylonian. So Paul, he's here, here he's telling the Corinthians who are in a very similar circumstance. They've got all of these pagan gods everywhere, and these pagan people are trying to get them to worship at these pagan sites. And he's telling them to get away, to not worship at them. Don't worship with the Aphrodite worshipers, the Zeus worshipers, or the Caesar worshipers. To stay away from that, to avoid them like the plague. As one commentator put it, he wrote this, uh, he wrote, our present passage is not a call. Look at that. It came back. Now you can read it with me. Okay. Our present passage is not a call to create a Christian ghetto, but a summons to purify the Christian community. Paul does not have in view the life of the church in the world, but the life of the world in the church. You see, Paul's emphasis here is for the community of the church to be pure. Paul wants us to be in the world, but he also, he desires to keep the values in the worship of the world out of the community of God's indwelt people. So Paul's third directive, it's in chapter seven, verse one. And let's look at that together. It says, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Now, I have to say, I love I love this statement. You see, you can see Paul's care for them here. He's not just calling them people from a distance. He's not commanding them as though he's like from on high. Here, I am the apostle. You must obey me. He calls them beloved. The Net Bible, it translates this well. He translates it as dear friends. I mean, he's that close with them. He's calling them his dear friends. 
Paul, he also includes himself for the first time in this passage here. You see, it's, it's let us cleanse ourselves. See, even the great apostle Paul, he wasn't beyond the need to purify himself so he could be holy. Which is another thing I love about this statement. You see, it's the recognition that we can't somehow change our values or align our identity so perfectly with Christ that we no longer need to purify ourselves. And I think that's very grace-giving to me, to know that even though I struggle in worshiping other things and getting my identity from other places and, and defilement of body and spirit, that I can still be cleansed. You see, Paul is telling the Corinthians and us at Fellowship Bible Church to not get our identity from our connection with unbelievers or to worship what they worship. Now, what would that look like today? Let me give you one example, maybe from this week for you. This season around the 4th of July, I think this is unusual. It's a really strong temptation that we get our identity from our country. You know, we see the fireworks, we listen to the music, and we remember the people like both my grandfathers who fought for our country. And me, it gets my pride going. And I get proud to be an American, or at least I know I'm free. No one, yeah, someone's saying, I'm not a good singer. Uh, they don't ask me to sing. Uh, but I mean, I've heard quite a few American worship songs this week. And I sometimes wonder if we don't worship our country. Now, I'm not saying we don't thank God for the freedoms of our country and what it allows us to have as Christians. We definitely should thank God for all the things that our country allows us to do and be so thankful for that. We definitely should do that. But I think there's a temptation there, at least for me, to go from thanking God for this incredibly good thing to making that good thing a God thing. And it becoming my primary identity so that it becomes, who am I? I'm an American. Now, that might not be your thing. Your thing might be, you might get your identity from the sport you play, the types of clothes that you wear, the car you drive, the house you own, any infinite number of other things. But the temptations there are incredibly endless. One other strong temptation that I think we can face is, is this one. Do you get your identity from the causes you stand for or what you stand against? Thank you. There's one no. I am glad. Now, I'm not going to say any of them in here because I, it's not only because I'm kind of afraid of what you might do to me if I uh, start to say these, uh, but because that's the opposite of what Paul is saying to do here. You see, as the church, our cause is Christ. Our identity is is the dwelling place of God. Our unity is the joint fear of God. Our joint honor and reverence for the living almighty God. You see, we cleanse ourselves not to be accepted. We cleanse ourselves because we are accepted. And that's a very important distinction to make. We are God's holy temple. We are set apart from those who don't believe. We are cleansed and cleansing ourselves. But why? Why identify only with Christ? Why separate ourselves? Why purify ourselves? Why? Because of, because of who we are. And because of God's promises. Because of who we are, our identity. And because of God's promises. First, who we are. Look at verse 14 with me again. And we already went through this, but first he states this order, right? He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But then he gets into why, and he says this in five questions. And all five of the questions are kind of like when your mom asked you this question. Hey, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? There is some yeses. That's unfortunate. Uh, the expected answer is no. That's insane. Of course I wouldn't jump off a bridge, mom. And if you're saying something else, good luck with you. Uh, because all of these questions, they're about the identity, our identity as God's dwelling place. And actually, they're phrased in such a way in Greek that it is not only, it's not even just like a, an assumption that we can make. They're phrased in a way that is very per particular to the answer being no. So he asks these questions. He says, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Now, that's another name for Satan, by the way. 
Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Of course, the answer to all these questions is none. None at all. It's not even possible. You see, we're supposed to identify with the righteous, with light, with Christ, with believers, because all of this, because of our identity as God's dwelling place, as the temple of the living God. Now look down at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 7 again, and you see how he starts this. He says, since we have these promises. But what promises is he, is he speaking about? What's he writing about here? The ones, Paul, he just wrote about in the Old Testament quote mashup I talked about earlier. This is what he's saying. Look at it, the starting in verse 16. As God said, this is where the promises start, I will make my dwelling among them. I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then he says that command. And then he says a little bit further down, then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. See, God makes six promises to us in these verses. God has made his dwelling among us. He is our God and we are his people. He has welcomed us. He has become our father when he adopted us as sons and daughters, as Toby so beautifully spoke about earlier. And he did this at great cost to himself. Fulfilling these promises, these gospel promises, they cost his son. Jesus, he came and died. He lived the life we could never live and died the death we deserved. So that as we believe our sins are forgiven and we are welcome, adopted and indwelt by the most high God, full of glory. And that makes us distinct. That makes us unique. And we are a distinct, unique group of people. But we've got to recognize this. We've got to recognize what, who, and whose we are as a church of the Lord Almighty in order to purify ourselves. And I love what Scott Hafman wrote in his commentary on this passage. And it's a bit long, but it is so good that I had to share it with you. So he, he writes this. Paul's call for separation and purity makes sense only if the church understands herself not to be just one more institution playing an essential role within the fabric of society, nor is the church a social service meeting the felt needs of her neighbors. Such a domestication of the church could not be more foreign to Paul's view of God's people or to her status as a disenfranchised minority in the Roman world in which Paul lived. Instead, as the new covenant people of God, the church is the family of God, united by a common identity in Christ and gathered around her common worship in fear of the Lord Almighty. Church, what he's saying is that we have to re-recognize our identity. We have to reassess who we are. You see, we're not simply some nonprofit NGO meeting a certain need of society. We're not some charity for meeting the felt needs of consumers as they show up. We are the new covenant people of God, where God dwells, united around the gospel, and united around the common worship of the Lord Almighty in the cause of the gospel of Christ. See, we're God's holy temple based on God's promises. And so, so we are called to not get our identity from anything outside of him, to identify only with God and worship him alone. And so the point of the message today, the point is to be God's holy temple dwelling with him in purity. Be God's holy temple, dwelling with him in purity. Be who you are, who you always were meant to be. God's holy temple. Remember your identity together as the church that we are God's temple, his dwelling place. So let's cleanse ourselves from everything that would keep us from purity. Let's be holy, set apart for God as God indwells us. Okay, so does that sound impossible to stay cleansed from everything that could ever defile us, to be perfectly holy, have no impurity, to never identify with anything but God? I'm hoping if I'm saying it well enough, you're, you're getting the picture that it does sound impossible. 
I mean, if you're getting, if it, if you do feel that way, then good, you're getting it because it is impossible. In our own strength, it is impossible. And this impossibility, it drives us to our knees at the foot of the cross to look to the one who is only ever perfectly pure with no sin, to look to Jesus who was so reliant on the Father that he said he did nothing on his own, but only what the Father tells him to, who then was crucified on the cross as our substitute. Look to Jesus. You see, God doesn't just indwell us as his holy temple. He empowers us to be holy so that we can rely on him, his strength to cleanse us, to purify us. God dwells within us. I mean, is there any greater motivation toward holiness than the fact that God empowers and indwells us with his glory and his holiness? So what do we do? What should we do to take this passage from Sunday morning to the other 167 hours of our week? So on your handout, if you grabbed one, or on the online notes, and in the connection card, you'll see a few steps. And what we do with those is we hope that you'll take, this will help you to take the Bible from Sunday morning into the rest of your week. And I and honestly, I do pray for that, that this does help you to take what you learned today as we worship together into the rest of your week. So here's a few things. First, study the image of God's temple throughout scripture. Study the image of God's temple throughout scripture. Focus on what God's temple is. Now, there's a couple of plan, great plans on version. And if you don't know what version is, check it out. That's the, the website, and you can download it for free on your phone. And uh, it's a great thing. Just search for temple. There's a, a lot of great opportunities there. And if you, you, there's also, I mean, you can just check out a concordance Bible site like Bible Gateway, and temple. And you can start reading the context around these passages and really start to dig into where that word is found. I mean, you can even just use an actual physical concordance. There's probably one that's got a lot of references in the back of any study Bible. So if you even just have a study Bible, you can look this up and start to dig into what is this imagery that we see of the temple? What does this look like? Learn for yourself, study for yourself, invest the time this week to study, to get into God's word and figure out what this temple aspects, what this looks like. I promise you will not, this will not be a time that you feel is wasted if you dig into God's word and and figure out what this temple imagery looks like. Now, second, Second, share. Share with another believer regarding your struggle of worshiping things other than God. Share your struggle of identifying with things or groups other than God. Share that struggle with someone else. Talk to your small group, your family, your life transformation group, even just someone you trust. But be sure to share this. Talk to someone about that. Now, you might be saying, if I don't struggle with that in any way. I might... But I have to, I gotta say, I I might question whether you know yourself that well. Because no less of a theologian than John Calvin himself, the great reformer, said, the human heart, he actually wrote this, the human heart is an idol factory. The human heart is an idol factory. Here's what that means. It means that we constantly have to fight the temptation to identify with things of our culture things that aren't from God, the idols that our culture lifts higher than God. We have to fight them because we want to produce them in ourselves. And as we recognize who, what those things are for us, we complete the next response. And finally, this is the last response, to pray and practice, to confess and repent of identifying with or idolizing anything other than God. Don't just try to avoid that group or that idol. Don't just try to turn your back on it just a little bit. We have to confess the sin. We have to recognize what that is. And what we're doing is we're letting something else into our spirit. We're polluting the holy place of the one true God with an idol. We have to recognize that sin. And we have to repent of that sin before God. And we have to run toward him. And let's remember this, that we are empowered by God to do that. So here's the ways to respond. Share, study, pray, practice. Take this message to your other 167 hours and focus on him this week. So you might have been wondering, maybe you were, if my high school football team won state, 
I see there was no one cared. That's okay. <laughs> we didn't, so I know I left you in suspense. That first game that we lost the entire season was the game right before the state championship. And we lost by two points, missed extra point. I can tell you the whole story later if you want to hear it. Uh, but our run to state was over. I mean, and it was hard for us on the team, even those who didn't play a whole lot. Uh, but here's the weird thing about this, right? It was harder on the people in the town than it was for a lot of us on the team who actually played. Some people, they just seem to be utterly destroyed by us losing a football game. By the way, that's one way to gauge whether you're identifying too much with something other than God. If it destroys you, if it lets you down, you're idolizing something other than God. Because when they let you down, and they will, and it, if it destroys you when that happens, you got your identity wrong. There is one that will never let you down, though, and he's the only place that you can truly trust and get your sense of worth from. You can trust God completely as your perfect father because he is perfectly holy. We've seen who we are, how to live, and why this morning, that we are God's holy temple. So let's purify ourselves to dwell with him in perfect purity. One way to do that right now is to pray. And so let me ask you as a corporate body, let's stand together and let's pray. And uh, as I pray, I'm going to ask the prayer team to go ahead and come up. And as we're standing, I'll give you a heads up on, on what that is. That's your opportunity to pray with people. If you have anything you want to pray about at all, this prayer team would love to pray with you. These are uh, elders. These are leaders in our church who would love to get to pray with you. Come talk to us. We'll be here for a little while after the service, and it'd be a great opportunity for us to get to, hang, to, get to know you and pray for you. Now let's pray together. Father God, you've made your dwelling place in us. You have made us your temple. You have welcomed us. You have become our father, adopted us as your sons and daughters. You have given us a new identity and made us a new creation. You have empowered us to live with you. So Father, we pray that we may put nothing before you, that we would cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles us, that we would not get our identity from anything but the wonder of your majesty, the glory of your light. May we bring holiness to completion as we stand in awe of you today and through this week and ongoing for the rest of eternity. In the name of the Son and by the Spirit that we pray, amen. Now I want to leave you with this benediction taken from this passage. May God grant you a fresh glimpse of his glory, a renewed vision of the beauty of his promises that we, we may complete our holiness by fearing him alone. Thank you for being here this week. We'll see you next week.